Welcome to this presentation covering Chapter 1 of our textbook. The topic for this chapter is Contract Law, a general introduction. Uh, this chapter is going to give kind of an overview of how our legal system works generally. So if this is your first uh, paralegal course, then you're going to learn a little bit about how our system works before we dive into the specifics that relate to contract law. If you've taken paralegal courses in the past, welcome back. Um, this will be a little bit of a refresher for you. Most of the stuff that um, I'll be talking about you're already familiar with, but it may be a good uh, little reminder of some of the concepts and terminology uh, going forward. So let's begin. Here we go. Let's begin by talking about some abbreviations that I'll be using pretty commonly. <clears throat> and these abbreviations aren't really unique to me. They're used by legal professionals throughout the United States. Uh, one big one, which you may not have seen before, is the abbreviation for contracts. Legal professionals use a capital K for that. Um, we don't use the C, we use the K. So from time to time, you'll see me uh, write a large K, and that is just a way of abbreviating contract. As you can imagine in this class, entitled contracts, we're going to be using the word contract very, very frequently. You certainly don't have to use the shorthand, but it's going to save you some writer's cramp as you're taking notes um, over the course of the semester. And by the way, before we get started, let me uh, give you some pieces of advice. Um, couple things. First of all, before you start the lecture, I would encourage you to look at the quiz question um, so that you'll have that idea, whatever that quiz topic is going to be. Uh, you'll be looking for it as you listen to the lecture, and then when you're done with the lecture, you'll be able to answer that quiz question really quickly. Um, the second thing that I'd recommend that you do is take notes as you're listening. Um, you certainly can listen once and then go back and take notes a second time as you listen. Um, you may find it useful to, to listen more than once, but um, if you're like me and your time is pretty short, you may want to combine your note taking with your first watch of the video. And the neat thing about watching a, a video versus me being live is that you can pause me. So if the telephone rings or you need to step out, step away and do something else or you want to re-listen to a portion um, you have that opportunity you can take notes at the speed that makes sense for you so please uh, be taking notes as you proceed um, and so make sure that that you uh, are getting the information you don't have to listen to this uh, more times than maybe would be most convenient for you okay so keep in mind the K for contract um, You'll see throughout these PowerPoints that I put certain terms in bold and in red. Usually these terms are straight from the textbook and probably 90% of the time I just lift the definition from the textbook. I copy it verbatim onto the slide. About 10% of the time I'm going to tweak the definition uh, just usually um, to, uh, I guess I think my definition is better. Uh, sometimes I'm borrowing part of the original definition and adding or subtracting some text. I usually will note when I, my definition is a little bit different than the textbooks, um, so be on the lookout for that. If I don't have a note, it probably means that my definition is verbatim. Um, I'm not going to promise you I've, I have included that language in every single one, but certainly generally speaking, if I don't have language, it's going to be close or very close to the definition of the textbook. Be on the lookout for these terms because this course is really weighted toward definitions. There's almost a, a whole new world of terms that we'll be covering over the course of the semester. And um, terms will build upon terms. So if you don't learn the vocabulary from chapter one, we go into chapter two, the assumption will be that you've mastered the terms from chapter one. And it'll almost start feeling like a foreign language in a way by the time we get to chapters four, five, and six, etc. So try to keep up to speed with vocabulary early on. It's going to make the material make a lot more sense to you. And uh, the other reason that you want to keep abreast of the terminology is that uh, studies indicate that it's difficult for our brains to master new terms. Learning new vocabulary words is a tricky thing for the human brain. And one thing that we do know is that it's much easier to learn terms if you learn just a few at a time. So perhaps you might set yourself up to learn two new vocabulary terms a day um, and keep on going at that rate. You're probably going to find that you spend up, end up spending less time than if you were to, say, try to learn 30 terms in a single day. 
way. And so my philosophy is be smarter, spend less time studying, get more bang from your study bucks, so to speak. So I encourage you to break it up over the course of the semester, um, both to increase your comprehension as we cover new material, but also to make you have to spend less time studying, to be honest with you. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. If you have a scarce amount of time to study, your first thing to master is going to be the vocabulary term. So make that a priority as you're going through the materials. I'm going to put in a little plug here for Quizlet. Let me just flash, show you what Quizlet is here. Let me just get out of this for a second. I'm going to go over here to here. I'll type in Quizlet. Quizlet is a free resource. They will want you to pay for it, but there's no need to pay for it. And um, I'm going to um, let's see, log in with Facebook. Oh, they, they want me to do that. I'm not, not going to pay, you see. Um, and you can see that I have lots and lots of Quizlets on my um, particular um, list. And they're all um, available to you. Uh, most of them relate to things that we're learning in this course. So let me just pull up. Uh, one from this course, let's see. Here we go, so I, ha I have them actually organized. I have a folder with the um, quizlets from this course. You'll see most of these are prepared by um, other students, students who've already completed the course. Um, and so let's say you are working on chapter five. Well, this is a pre-made quizlet. What are the best ways to master the material in Quizlet? Well, there's lots of different ways of doing it. Probably when you're starting out, you may want to use the flashcards or perhaps some of the games like Match or Gravity. As you get closer, though, to test time, I encourage you to consider using Test. You click on this option, and then you would go over here again to Options, and I would encourage you to pick mat, um, Multiple Choice and True False. And it could be, and the reason to pick these is that this is most similar to the format of our test. If you do this, you will have virtually <laughs> verbatim some of the test questions. Um, they are designed, uh, you know, there's only so much you can do with vocabulary terms on tests. And about half of the test questions that we have will be pretty much straight vocabulary. And so you're virtually um, seeing test questions and responding to test questions. Uh, over the course of the semester. Um, you know, it's great to use Quizlet the night before a test, but I would encourage you to use it consistently through. Spending 10 minutes a day on Quizlet um, can be tremendously helpful as you get closer and closer. And again, the, the small amounts of studying over several days is worth a lot more to you in terms of the return that you're going to get than cramming the night before. So anyway, this is a neat resource. Um, you know, the best way to do it is not to use, uh, let me go back here, is not to use these prepackaged ones. It's to create your own, to be honest with you. But I realize that time is, is scarce for us all, and so you might find it useful to uh, use some of these prepackaged ones. That's your decision whether you want to do that or not. Um, you can see here we have a contracts final review um, that is 125 for a term, so that might be a a, a good one to, to use as you're preparing for the final. But in the, any event, whether you use one of these prepackaged ones or you come up with your own, please consider doing this early and often. Um, so let's go back to our PowerPoint. Just wanted to introduce the idea of Quizlet. There's other services out there that do very similar things to Quizlet. Um, the good thing about Quizlet is that um, we have a lot of resources already built in. They're already positioned on Quizlet, but you may find some of the other services also have some of these uh, tools as well. So um, use what you think makes sense for you. Um, this is just one resource of many that uh, may be valuable. Um, when students come to see me because they aren't performing well in class, this is what I recommend. And I'll be glad to work with you in maneuvering through Quizlet if that is an issue for you. Okay. So let's, let me get off my soapbox and return to the substance. Here are some other abbreviations that I'll use very commonly. This is, of course, the pi sign. The pi sign is a Greek letter that uh, represents the p or p sound in Greek. And this is, again, what is used for plaintiff. So when you see me make the pi sign, it's my abbreviation for plaintiff. The delta sign, which is basically just a, a triangle, is stands for delta or the d 
D sound, and that's abbreviation for defendant. So again, we'll be, writing, we'll be referring to the terms plaintiff and defendant throughout the year. Legal professionals figured out a long time ago, there's no point in writing out these words again and again. These abbreviations help a lot. Uh, this next one is a little bit more, while well, the first three, the K, the Pi, and the Delta are uh, used by virtually all legal professionals, I would say, in the United States, these are a little bit more quirky with me. Some use these, but not everyone. And we'll see that there's a lot of legal words that we're going to be learning that end O-R and that um, lots also end in E-E. Um, and so what I usually will do is I will just, once I've introduced the, the term, for example, promisor, I won't write out the whole word promisor every time. I'll just write out O-R. And then when I talk about the promisee, I won't, won't write out promisee. I'll just say E-E. -E. Again, it's just a way to save a little bit of writer's cramp. So that's a pattern that I'll be pointing out from time to time. Hopefully these abbreviations help. If you like to write out the whole word, though, that also works. So you may be thinking, well, what is a contract? How do I enter into a contract? How do my clients enter into contracts? Uh, the reality is that you've probably already entered into a contract today, and uh, maybe into multiple contracts a day. We do these all the time, virtually every day. It's just a part of living in the modern world. It's what we do. Uh, you do this almost more than anything else. Um, if you stop at the Kroger and buy some groceries, guess what? You entered into a contract. Uh, buy some gas at, and you, you put your credit card into the uh, credit card reader as you uh, fill your tank. Guess what? You entered into a contract. Um, got a haircut? You entered into a contract. Signed up for a smartphone? You entered into a contract. We do this all of the time. Now, many of these contracts, we, we don't result in any kind of dispute or really you're not even aware that you're entering into a contract, and yet they are legally binding. These aren't the types of contracts usually that you're going to be involved with as a legal professional, certainly, but they are in the category of the types of contracts that we'll be dealing with in this class. And so it's useful to understand that uh, contracts are actually a really broad concept. If we think about this as the world of contracts, we won't be talking a lot about the Kroger contract, um, but we'll be talking about some specialized contracts that make up a relatively small part of the universe. I think though it's helpful to keep in mind that the universe is really big and a lot of these contracts maybe don't result in litigation, but they still are contracts. Okay, so now we're gonna even back up farther, I said at the beginning when we were just on the first slide of this presentation, I talked about the fact that there may be some students in the program who've never taken the legal course before. And because we don't have prerequisites on this course, I want to make sure that the course is set up so that people at varying levels of legal knowledge can feel comfortable and be successful in the course. And so I'm going to kind of backtrack at this point and talk about some really kind of entry level concepts. If you've taken paralegal courses before, you might kind of doze off at this point. I completely understand that, but keep at least a little bit of an ear tuned in case that there's something that might have slipped your mind that this might be a good refresher for you. If this is your first course, you may want to listen to this part more than once. And again, if you find some of these concepts um, are confusing or you want a little bit more clarity, please come see me. I'll be delighted to spend a lot of time going over these concepts in more detail. Um, I'm not going to do a tremendously deep dive because most people who take this course have also taken other paralegal courses. So this will be kind of a brief examination of issues with the understanding that if you need more, I am absolutely available to provide more support. Okay, so when we talk about contract law, where do we find it? Well, there's two main places in the United States that we find contract law. The first is common law, and then the second is statutory law. And this shouldn't be a surprise for those of y'all that have had uh, other paralegal paralegal courses because these are the main two areas that we find almost all of our law, um, common law and statutory law. These are the usual kind of buckets. If you imagine our legal system uh, having buckets where we, where we hold law, well, we hold a lot of our law, but we hold most of our law in the United States in the common law bucket. But we certainly do have statutes. We, set, we have laws that Congress or the state legislatures have passed, and those certainly are a source of, of um, law. And so that would be another bucket, even though, of course, it's smaller than the common law bucket. We also have other buckets that are even smaller than our first two, but the ones that are really important for contract law are the common law bucket and the statutory bucket. 
So let's talk about what this common law bucket is. And this is the definition from the textbook. Law found in the decisions of courts rather than statutes. Judge made law. You can see here we have a judge. He's got a gavel. He's got his robes. You can see he's in a fancy judge type chair. Um, when he renders a decision, he is acting in his official capacity as a judge. And that means he is creating law. And I say he's creating law because he isn't deciding a case just for the two individuals who are appearing before him. We'll say that Bob is suing Larry. So yes, this judge, we'll call him Judge Smith. Judge Smith is rendering a decision that's going to affect Bob's rights and Larry's rights. Um, Bob and Larry are very interested in what Judge Smith is going to say. But Judge Smith is doing more than deciding Bob's rights and Larry's rights. He's also creating law that has relevance to the next people who find themselves in a case similar to Bob's and Larry's. People who don't even know Bob and Larry. People who have no connection to Bob and Larry. Um, they are going to be affected by the decisions that this judge makes because he doesn't decide just this case. He's creating precedents that are going to affect the law in this particular jurisdiction, possibly for generations to come. That's how the common law system works. So where do we find this common law? Where do we find these decisions made by judges? Well, they are found in what we call cases. And of course, a case is just basically this, Bob versus Larry. It's the judge's written document that resolves this particular dispute, at least until Bob or Larry decides to appeal that decision, of course. Um, cases are found in um, books that we call reporters. Um, the example of the reporter that we use in Texas state courses is this, uh, Texas state qu courts is the uh, a Southwestern reporter. In the federal system, we call uh, uh, federal appellate courts we call those federal reporters. So the term reporter is the book that holds all of these cases. Um, if you are interested in seeing the actual books, you can go to the library on the Spring Creek campus. And in the uh, legal book section, we have tons and tons of reporters. If you are on the Preston Ridge campus and you'd like to see what they look like, I have a few in my office, uh, just to give you kind of a sense as to what those look like. Um, but you don't have to do either one of those because I will show you um, an example of a case. Here we go. I'm going to go into a particular case. And so where I, I pulled this up was in Google Scholar. Um, here is an example of a case. We can see the names of the parties. We have Tur Turhan Dunnings and we have Melinda Jean Castro. Those are the parties, just like I said, Bob versus Larry, well, Dunnings versus Castro. This is the reporter that where this case appears. So it's in Southwestern Reporter, the second edition, in volume 881. It begins on page 559, and this opinion was published in 1994. This is the actual case number of that case. And then we can see the court where this decision was decided. It's a Texas Court of Appeals, so this is within the Texas state system, and it is an appellate court. We have trial courts here at the bottom. We have the Texas Supreme Court here at the top, and then we have a middle level, and that's where this is, a Court of Appeals. It's not the Supreme Court, but it's also not a trial court. It's not the first court that you go to. In Texas, in the state system, we have 14 courts of appeal, and this is the first court of appeal, and this is located in Houston. We have the date of the decision, August 4th, 1994, and we can see it's the same date that we have up here. Usually this date will be the same as this date. We have some other information. Because this is not the actual uh, edition that is published in Southwestern Reporter, we're missing some of the stuff that usually goes in here, this proprietary with uh, a company called um, West. Here we have the actual decision beginning. I was talking about Judge Smith. Well, this particular case, we have Justice O'Connor. He or she is the author of this decision. Now, in this particular level of our court system, we have three judges hearing the case. 
And so one of those three actually wrote the decision. Actually, we have the names of the judges right here. So we have O'Connor, Duggan, and Hudson Dunn. These three individuals are the three judges who are hearing this case. And of course, only one of them actually wrote the decision. And then we have the actual opinion. This is what a case looks like. This is what the common law looks like. We'll talk more about this case later on, but I wanted to introduce this to you. Um, and uh, uh, this gives you kind of an idea of where it is. So if you're interested in looking at opinions, uh, you just go to scholar.google.com and you can pull up virtually any decision that's been published um, that's been decided in the, in the U.S. court system, um, certainly in the last several decades. Most of them are available now. Okay, so let's go back to, we've talked about common law, we've talked about where to find cases. Um, and we, let's also just talk for a second about the restatement of law. We'll talk about this later and from time to time throughout the course, but uh, let's spend just a moment talking about what this is. As you can imagine from what I just showed you in the Dunning's case, is that it's hard to find cases. I mean, uh, let's say you want to research a particular issue of contracts law. Uh, you want to find the cases, but how would you find a case? The cases are arranged chronologically, and it doesn't so happen that all the contract cases happened in 1957, and so you just go to that particular volume of the Southwestern Reporter. Um, there's probably one or more contract cases in every single one of the reporters, and probably more than one in most of the reporters. So for you to find all the uh, contracts cases, you'd have to look at every single one of those reporters and read every single one of those cases. But, you know, most of those cases don't have anything to do with contracts. You know, there's a murder case, there's a, a divorce, there's a car accident. Uh, there's all kinds of issues that have nothing to do with contracts, and you'd have to wage through those. Plus, even if you were to just find all the contracts cases, I mean, some of the contract issues in some of the cases wouldn't be relevant to the particular issue you were researching. So you can see how it would be really, really time consuming for you to go to a reporter and just keep on looking until you found all of the cases that were relevant. Um, as a result of this problem with the common law, um, various resources have developed over the years to help legal professionals find cases in a more efficient way. And one of those tools is called the restatement of law. And then this particular restatement of law that we're concerned about is the second restatement of contracts. And what has happened here is, is a group of legal scholars have gotten together and said, hey, um, we want to look at all the contract law and kind of summarize it. Um, write it as if it were going to be a statute. And we're going to cite all of the cases that we're using uh, to support our idea of what the law is in a particular area. So a legal scholar can look at the restatement of contracts and find the particular part of the law that he or she is interested in that's relevant to his or her case and look and see, uh, number one, what the authors of the restatement thinks the law is on that particular issue. And number two, and probably more importantly, find the cases that talk about that. In other words, it will lead the reader back to the cases. So this resource points back to the case authority. The restatement is what we call a secondary resource. We'll talk more about what that means later on. Um, a case is a primary resource. So just kind of file those terms in your head for a second. So that's our very brief introduction to the common law. We'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Now let's talk about what statutory law is. This is probably a more immediately understandable source of law. This is when the state legislature um, passes a law and the governor signs it, or maybe it's the Congress passing a law and the president signs it. Once the chief executive officer for that level of government has signed the, that statute, it becomes a, a statute. It becomes a law. Everybody has to follow it until um, the, uh, the legislature changes the law or perhaps some branch of the government finds it to be unconstitutional. Um, with respect to statutory law, there's very little federal contract law. 
almost all of it is going to be state law driven. Um, and so a few times that a federal law comes up, we'll, we'll flag it, but certainly the, the, for the vast majority, we're looking at state law. And really, we're just looking at one state law. So in a way, this is a very easy a statutory scheme. What we care about in this course, in terms of statute, is the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code. I will probably refer to the UCC 200 times over the course of, of this course. It's a really, really important statute. It's by far the most important statute. It's not as important as all of the common law. You know, certainly I would say the common law is probably 75% of this course and the UCC is 25% of the course. But it's still a really, really important part of the course. As a result, I'm not going to be writing out Uniform Commercial Code. I'm going to be writing UCC. Just know what UCC stands for. It stands for Uniform Commercial Code. This is a body of contract related statutes. We'll talk more about what's involved in the UCC um, as we progress in the course, but I wanted to introduce the concept to you now. There's also a few other statutes that are relevant, and we'll talk about those very, very briefly um, later on in this particular chapter. Examples of those are eSign, um, the uh, UETA, and the UCITA. These have to do with e-commerce. A lot of it has to do with, as you can see, signatures. How are you going to document and prove up a signature when it's an electronic signature? Those issues um, um, are, we, we've got some from both state and federal laws relating to these topics. So let's go back to the top, the, the uh, top concept we have, really the common law, which is again, by far the most important part of contract law in the United States. It's case law. We don't have a lot of statutes in the area. If I take the UCC out of the equation, we have almost no statutes in this area. Almost all of our contract law is based upon judicial decisions. Let's see how that works out. Let's imagine for a second, I'm gonna draw a little picture here. Let's imagine for a second that this is the entire universe of laws, of legal issues that can, I'm sorry, this is the entire universe of legal issues that can come up. And let's imagine we're back in, I don't know, 1400s England, and the parliament is meeting in London, and they decide, you know what, we need a law against murder, so we're gonna make a law against murder. And then, you know what, we, we need a law against uh, robbery, too. That would be a good idea. And maybe we should have a law against arson. I think that would be a good thing. And maybe we ought to have a law against, or that describes how people can get married. And we sure need laws about how taxation works. That's a given. And um, other issues come up. And so, gosh, we need to pass a law about this. Oh, you know what, the king really wants us to pass a law about this, so we'll do that. And gosh darn it, some, some member of parliament really thinks this issue is important. So we'll go ahead and pass a law about that. That's the way our legal system in, in the history of our, judi our, our legal system has been. It's been kind of an ad hoc basis. Um, so again, obviously our legal system developed in England because obviously we were a colony. Um, so we look at the, uh, the, the formation of our legal system back again in England and then of course in the American colonies and eventually in the American states. And we've had that tradition. Um, the legislature in Austin doesn't s see itself as, gosh, we're going we're gonna to want to make sure we're legislating in every single area that we need law. Instead, they identify an issue that they think is important and they write a law about it. But it's not systematic. They don't think to themselves, wait a second, we're going to make sure that we fill every single bit of every single issue that come up. And so we're going to do a grid here of all the issues that might arise in a particular topic and we're going to check things off. Okay, we've covered that issue. Okay, we've covered that issue. Okay, now we need a statute about this. Okay, now we need a statute about this. That's not how our system has ever worked, and I don't think it is ever how it will work. Instead, it's some person saying, gosh, I really care about this issue. Okay, well, let's, let's think about this issue. But nobody seems to care about this issue, so nobody passes a law about it. The common law, um, 
or the, 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 the legislature comes up with these uh, categories here. Let me fill some of these in so you can see. So they pass this law in this area. But you know what happens? Is that parliament in England or maybe it's the legislature in Austin or in Washington, D.C., it doesn't have a crystal ball. It doesn't know everything that might happen. So while it is maybe thinking about passing a law about murder, it doesn't think, well, maybe we need a law about stealing. Didn't occur to anybody to pass a law about that. But guess what? Just because it didn't occur to the parliament doesn't mean that someone isn't going to steal. They might still steal. And so a judge is faced with a situation where somebody has stolen, but there's no law. There's no action from parliament that says that's a crime. Well, what is the judge supposed to do? Well, he has to fill, he or she has to fill in the gaps. He or she has to come up with law in this area right here that we don't have any law. Now, the judge would wishes that, gosh, it's a shame the legislature didn't act in this area. The judge kind of would prefer that the legislature had uh, passed a law in this area so the judge could just look at the statute and say, oh, wow, I know what the answer in this situation is. I'll just follow what the statute says. But as I said before, we don't have this systematic system where every box gets checked. There's huge areas, there's huge gaps. And so the judge has to say, well, wait a second. I can't point to a statute that answers this question, so I'm going to have to answer it myself. Um, and so that's the common law. Those are those judge-made decisions. So how does a judge render a decision when there isn't a statute? Well, he's going to look to tradition. And when I say he, because, of course, most judges historically have been men, but certainly women can be judges as well. He looks at the behavior of parties. Well, what makes sense? What feels like where we ought to go? He also looks at custom. And when he looks at custom, he may also look at statutes that are kind of close. Well, the parliament or the legislature passed a law prohibiting robbery, so probably they wouldn't think that uh, thievery is a good idea either. So he makes analogies. Um, another thing that a judge looks to is he looks to decisions by other judges. And this is one of the things that distinguishes the common law from the civil, uh, civil law systems. Um, let me just pause and talk about the difference between common law and civil law systems. Most parts of the world are civil code or civil law systems. When we use the term civil in this context, I don't mean civil in the sense of polite, like I might say, boy, that young man is very civil, meaning he's very personable and uh, well-behaved and, and pleasant to be around. Civil in this context isn't saying the person has good manners. Civil also doesn't mean non-criminal. A lot of times we talk about criminal law and civil law, and certainly civil law can refer to non-criminal matters. But when I say, for example, uh, Mexico has a civil law system, well, obviously Mexico has criminal laws and civil laws. But when I talk about its entire system, I'm not referring to just the fact that it has non-criminal laws. Obviously it does. But I'm referring to the way the law is structured. So another way of referring to the civil law jurisdictions would be, say, they're not common law jurisdictions, okay? And the big distinction between common law jurisdictions and civil law jurisdictions is this lovely Latin word here, stare decisis. Stare decisis is a Latin expression. If you haven't learned it yet in the program, please learn it now because attorneys say this all the time. It's an important idea to have. It's Latin. This is an, uh, an infinitive in Latin. This means to stand by a decision. And this is the idea that when a judge renders a decision, let's say a judge, let me change the color here of my little marker. We'll make this one dark. So when a judge makes a decision here, and then 20 years later that issue comes up again, uh, there ha the legislature hasn't passed any statutes about it, but that another judge 20 years later reads the decision from the earlier judge, he knows what to do. He doesn't have to think too hard about this issue. He just has to apply the precedent. Just like in a civil code system, the judge applies the statutes, follows those authorities. Uh, a judge in a common law jurisdiction, he also or she also follows the statutes. But on top of following statutes, 
when there is no statute, he or she looks to prior decisions by courts in that jurisdiction. And we call that stare decisis. And again, here's a description of the rule. Again, you see this term is in red, so it's one of these definitional terms you want to be sure to spend some time on. The rule that a court should apply the same legal principle to the same set of facts and apply it to later cases that are similar. Now, obviously, if your case has to do with, or if, if a judge is hearing a case, we'll change the color to green, is hearing a case about um, mugging somebody, well, that's not the same thing as, as uh, th theft, so this precedent's not really that helpful for this case. But let's say that I happen to have a case involving theft it's very close to the same facts. Well, that would, then this, this earlier case, this blue case would be very relevant. I, as a judge, would want to hear a lot about that case because the facts are so similar. A term related to stare decisis is the term precedent. This is a little bit easier to spell and to pronounce. Let's look at the word precedent for a second. Sometimes, for me at least, it's easier for me to understand a term when it's been broken down to its constituent parts. We see that we have three parts this word. We have our base word, which we don't actually use in English, um, seed, we don't use this very often, then we have a uh, prefix, which is pre, and then we have a suffix, which is ent. We know in English pre means before, and said in this context means come, and this is before. And we can say this is a signal that we're dealing with a noun. So this is something that comes before. So a precedent is something that comes before. And it also has one more idea. It's something that comes before that must be followed. So um, if I were to say to you, um, be sure in, in this class, um, you need to um, turn in your homework by the due date. And then you hear that several students um, miss the due date and I gave them an extension. And then a few weeks later, you had a similar situation to whatever caused these other students to miss the deadline. And you might come to me and you might say, hey, Professor Groover, I would like an extension. And my first answer might be, well, I, I don't accept late homework, which, which I don't, by the way. Um, and then you might say, but I know what you did with Larry and with Bob and with Teresa and with Susan. Well, what you're using is you're using the concept of precedent. You're saying, wait a second, the way you treated those earlier cases ought to be the way you treat my case. And so you're making an argument that I need to be consistent. I need to follow whatever I've done before. And of course, precedent can apply to one particular judge. When a judge makes a decision, say, in 2010, well, he or she should follow that same logic in 2017 and 2020 and going forward. Um, but it's not just that individual judge, but it would be other judges. So um, let's say I establish a practice where I allow late homework, um, but another professor in our department, maybe he or she doesn't permit that. Well, the doctrine of precedent would say, well, he ought, the other uh, uh, judge ought to follow my precedent, my pre-existing practice as a practical matter. He or she doesn't have to, um, but in a, if, if we were all judges, the fact that one judge does something, especially a judge that is in a higher position than the other judges, then that would mean that they all ought to follow that practice. So when we look at precedent, we're looking at um, did that same court render a decision about similar facts or did a higher court in that same jurisdiction render a decision. And if that one or the other is true, then that becomes a precedent that needs to be followed. The doctrine of stare decisis applies. And so this is the foundation of common law. Civil jurisdictions don't have this idea for the most part. So if we were in France or Germany or Japan, uh, non-common law jurisdictions, uh, judges really only decide cases, going back to our Judge Smith here, Remember, he was hearing the case of Bob versus Larry. 
Well, in a civil code jurisdiction, let's say we were in uh, Mexico and he were a judge there, he would be deciding the case for Bob and Larry, but his decision would have no greater impact than however it impacts Bob and Larry. Even if 10 years later, Teresa and Susan had the exact same fact pattern in front of the same judge. Uh, judge Smith is still there. Uh, he would not be bound. He would not be required to follow the same ideas that he followed in Bob and Larry's case because he's in a civil jurisdiction. Precedent has very little significance in that system. But the common law says, ah, precedent is important. We want that consistency um, when there isn't a statute. We want judges to be bound by the decisions of other judges uh, at the same level or higher level within that particular jurisdiction. And why do we have that rule under the common law? Well, we think it's socially useful. <clears throat> it meets the needs that we've identified for our society because we know that there's these gaps. Unlike the civil code system where all the boxes, or at least there's the attempt to check all the boxes and answer all the questions, ours is a much more kind of ad hoc system. We know there's going to be gaps. We're okay with there being gaps because we have starry decisis and that lets us fill in those blanks. Okay, I've already kind of talked about this, the difference between mandatory authority. That's what I've been talking about when I talk about authority, mandatory authority. That's stare decisis. That's when uh, Judge Smith has to follow the decisions, for example. Let's, now we've moved Judge Smith to an appellate judge in Dallas County. Well, guess what? He has to follow what the Texas Supreme Court says, even if he disagrees with it, even if he thinks the decision was poorly reasoned and just flat out wrong. Judge Smith is going to have to follow the Texas Supreme Court because that's a mandatory authority in his particular uh, judicial area. Dallas, uh, uh, Dallas Court of Appeals, which is the fifth Court of Appeals in Dallas, is in the state of Texas, and it has to do what the Texas Supreme Court says. At the end of the day, the Texas Supreme Court is in some sense his boss, and so he needs to do what that court says. That's a mandatory authority. But let's imagine that the Oklahoma Supreme Court had rendered a decision. Does Judge Smith in Dallas have to follow what the um, Oklahoma Supreme Court said? Absolutely not. Even though that's a higher court than his court, it's a court in a different state, so it's in a different jurisdiction. Let's say the Texas Supreme Court hasn't rendered a decision on the particular issue, and there's no Texas statute on this issue. Uh, but the Oklahoma Supreme Court has rendered an, a decision on this issue. It might well be that Judge Smith is interested in seeing what the Oklahoma Supreme Court did. After all, more you know, hearing from other good, uh, good legal minds is, is always good before rendering a decision. But we would call that type of authority a persuasive authority. And what do we mean when we say a persuasive authority? Well, it's a legal authority that may be followed by a court. Mandatory authority must be followed by a court. A persuasive authority is usually going to be from a secondary, from a, uh, another jurisdiction or from a secondary source. So again, this would be an example of Oklahoma. Um, so when Judge Smith listens to that decision from the Oklahoma Supreme Court, he may be persuaded by the strength of the legal arguments advanced in that decision. But let's say he's not persuaded. Let's say he thinks that the Oklahoma Supreme Court is just wrong. Guess what? He doesn't have to do it. He can say, uh-uh. Not doing that. Don't think that's well reasoned. I wasn't persuaded by that decision, so therefore I'm not going to follow it. So again, this is the, the strong authority. This is the one that Judge Smith has to follow. This one he only follows if he wants to, if he thinks it's a wise decision to follow. Obviously, both these terms are in red, so be sure to be familiar with these terms. Usually people don't have a lot of difficulty following this one, but sometimes people uh, uh, think persuasive authority is a, a binding authority, and it's not. So that's a, a little thing for you to maybe flag as you look at these terms. Okay, so let's now consider 
why we have this common law tradition. What does this get us? It may seem like it's a little confusing and a little bit maybe counterintuitive, but it does have a lot of strengths associated with it. And many legal scholars have identified three things that we get out of the common law. And it's probably one of the, these three things are probably the reason why we have decided to continue having a common law tradition. And by the way, we're by, by no means the only country that has a common law tradition. Basically, if you look around the world, if a significant population in that country are native English speakers, they probably are a common law jurisdiction. They probably were once part of Great Britain. Certainly the United States was, Canada, India, Australia, um, parts of Africa, um, uh, Ireland, obviously uh, the United Kingdom. Those places um, have continued to have the common law tradition places where English is not uh, largely spoken as a native language by a significant portion of the population probably never were a colony of Great Britain and they probably have a civil code tradition. So what are the strengths of the common law? And by the way, they're both good systems, so I'm not here to advocate for one over the other. Um, both, both can work very, very well and be very uh, productive for, for a particular country to have. But let's look at what makes the common law system so awesome. One is that it creates the opportunity for fairness. There is some flexibility. You know, a statute, when it's written, um, the legislature, the, the, the legislators, um, don't have a crystal ball. And they oftentimes are getting involved in horse trading. You know, one legislator wants X, another legislator wants Y, and they decide, well, if you give me Y, I'll give you X, and there's a back and forth, and there's uh, things written on the back of envelopes, and things are decided in smoky rooms, and um, some deals are done at the last minute without necessarily a lot of careful, careful reflection. Um, that's okay. That happens in life, and, and we understand that, uh, but there can be a certain amount of, gosh, we didn't even think about that, or Boy, it didn't even cross our minds that that might result in that happening. When you have judges involved, they can look at the big picture, how this particular situation is impacting these two litigants. They can look at it and go, you know what? Um, in theory, I think the rule ought to be X, but when I look at how it impacts the people in this case, X doesn't really feel right. I feel like maybe we ought to have an exception to that X rule. We th I think X is a good rule 99% of the time, but not in this case. And so it, it, there, that flexibility allows there to be some fairness, some notion of uh, the system not being so uh, blind and automated that it, it can't respond to the human element, to the unusual fact pattern to the uh, twist in the facts that is unexpected. Another benefit to the common law though is predictability. And this is kind of intention, has some tension with fairness because we do want there to be predictability. I mean, we do want Judge Smith to have to follow mandatory authority even when he doesn't agree with it. Um, and so it's good that there is this predictability because think about a system where you go into the court and you have no idea what the judge is gonna do. I mean, it all turns on what he had for lunch. Sometimes Judge Smith, you know, if, if you, you catch him uh, before lunch, he's a little bit hungry, his blood sugar's a little bit low, he's likely to rule against you just because he's having a bad day. But you know what? After he's had a good lunch, he is going to issue decisions in your favor. And it's all when you catch him. Well, that would be a crazy system. Um, that's not the kind of system we want. We want Judge Smith's rulings to be the same, whether it's, a hearing at 9 a.m. or a decision at 3 p.m. We want the decision to be consistent over time and consistent between judges. We don't want Judge Smith um, decisions to be different than Judge um, Dominguez's or Judge Brown's or Judge Harris's or Judge Chin's or whomever is rendering the decision. We want us to be able to anticipate the decisions that happen. And the um, mandatory authority the story decisive idea allows us to have that predictability. Finally, we have the idea of evolution. And by the way, predictability is, is a big factor in, in the civil code because of course when you have statutes that check off every box, 
you have a lot of predictability, perhaps even more than in our system. You may not have as much flexibility, so there may be some issues about fairness. One of the challenges, though, in a civil code system is evolution. You know what? We live in a world, especially in the last, say, 20 or 30 years, where there's constantly change, many of it technological, but some of it is cultural. You know, when I was growing up, I promise you I never thought that we would have cell phones or uh, cable TV or, um, uh, you know, iPads or, or so many of the technologies that we use on a daily, daily basis. Um, and um, our legislature didn't have a crystal ball either. And so many times the technology is before our legislature can even uh, respond to those issues. And so things can get into litigation um, when there really aren't any statutes out there yet. And so the judges have to fill in that gap. They have to apply uh, the laws that have developed in other contexts and say, well, let's, let's argue by analogy. Let's make some comparisons or let's apply our common sense to these situations. And so the law can evolve in a really natural, hopefully in an organic way, um, with lots of different judges uh, adding just a little bit new piece to the law. So that's what we want um, the common law to do. And when it's working well, it is what happens. Of course, no system is perfect, but these are things that we look to in the common law. As you can see, when I talk about predictability, another term for that is consistency. We want uh, our common law to be as consistent as possible, predictable as possible. It's key to our success in the common law. If we didn't have predictability and consistency, we wouldn't be working very well. Okay, so we've talked about the common law, and we've talked a lot about statutes. But there are other sources of what we're going to call primary law, primary sources of law. Let me just pause and talk about what a primary source of law is. Primary source of law is what you and I think of when we hear the term the law. The law. It's when somebody in the government, in his or her official capacity as government employee, says, hey everybody, you got to do X, or hey everybody, you need to stop doing X. Um, so when a judge is wearing his or her black robes and he or she enters a decision, guess what? That's the law. That's common law. When the legislature passes a bill and the governor or the president signs it, that's a statute. We think of that as a law. When um, a, an amendment is added to our state or federal constitution, that becomes the law. When a regulatory agency renders or issues a uh, a regulation, um, then that becomes the law. So let's look at these terms here. And again, we have the red letters, so you want to be on the lookout for these as you prepare for, um, uh, uh, you know, for tests and quizzes and, and assignments and things like that. Okay, so we have Constitution. What is that? Well, in our system, it's a document, federal document or state document, that sets up the basic principles and general rules of a country um, or a state. Again, we have a state constitution, the Texas Constitution, and we have uh, the U.S. Constitution. Let me just show you the Texas Constitution. Texas Constitution is commonly amended. It's a pretty easy, um, the way to find it is I'll just go to Texas Statutes. It's the first hit on Google. And I will go look at the very first thing is the Texas Constitution. I'll just go to the preamble so you can see how it starts. This is our preamble. Humbly invoking the blessings of Almighty God, the people of the state of Texas do ordain and establish this Constitution. And you could go in, you could see, um, so we don't need the preamble. Let's see, we might go to the Bill of Rights. What kind of Bill of Rights do we have? Well, again, we have um, freedom of speech and the press. Um, we have uh, searches, rules about searches and seizures. We have rights about bail. 
lots of different um, parts of the um, uh, the Constitution. And again, the Constitution itself is um, a rather long document. So we won't go through various parts of it, but we have it, um, just like we have a U.S. Constitution. We also have administrative law, another good term for this. Let me go back to is to think about this as being regulatory law. Again, this is when some government agency uh, develops regulations or rules. Or there's lots of different names for it. Um, in order for a regulatory agency to issue a rule, it has to have that authority. Um, from either the court system or the legislature. Now let's talk about another source of, of law, and that is procedural rules. These are the rules that courts follow, also the administrative agencies follow, to, um, uh, to describe how to, to get all of the, the goodies that these particular laws and regulations give citizens. So let's say I'm in a car accident and I want to sue Bob because I think Bob caused the car accident. Well, where do I file my lawsuit? How long do I have to wait to file my lawsuit? What needs to be in that document? How do I need to get that document to Bob? What is, what is Bob supposed to do when he gets the document? Does he need to file something? If he does, what does that need to look like? How long does he have? Uh, what's the next step after everybody files those initial documents? All of those questions are, are trying to answer the question of how. What procedures should we follow? They're not describing who's going to win the case, just saying what system do we have to let that particular dispute go through um, the process to reach a resolution. And so procedural rules you could consider them kind of like statutes, but they usually don't go through the legislature. Usually courts develop their own procedural rules. So these are examples of primary sources of law. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what one of these common law decisions look like. So we're looking again at the common law. I'm just going to put the word common law here so we can keep that in mind as we talk about this. One of the first things when you see a case is you're going to be interested in seeing who are the parties to the case. Uh, obviously, when we use the term parties, we're not talking about, you know, a holiday party. We're talking about the people who are involved in litigation. We're talking about the plaintiff and the defendants. So let me just write this plaintiff. Okay, I'm going to use my little pie sign and defendant, my delta sign. Uh, sometimes there's just two parties to a case, but there might be multiple plaintiffs or multiple defendants. So we have the first party is a plaintiff, and you can see the plaintiff files a document called the complaint. Again, look at the red here. That tells you this is a definitional term. I've provided the definition in this case in the parentheses. So you can see in the beginning of the word plaintiff, we have the end of the word complaint, right? So you can see that connection between these two. And it makes sense that we call the document that begins a lawsuit a complaint because after all, the plaintiff has a complaint. The plaintiff is mad. Nobody files a lawsuit thinking, yeah, everything's going great. Just want to say thanks. Nobody does that. You file a lawsuit because you're mad at somebody because you think that person has done something wrong, has injured you in some sense. You've got a complaint that you want the court to resolve. And so it's a pretty logical term that we have for that. This is the document that we file in federal court. That's the name for it. And that's the definition. That's the term that uh, the textbook talks about because our textbook is a federal textbook. But you know what? We also have a term that we use in Texas state courts. It's a little different. And it's the term petition. This is not an unusual. You'll see this in other uh, jurisdictions as well. It's exactly the same thing as a complaint. Um, but again, procedural law varies. So a procedural law in the federal system says, call that first document filed by, I'm sorry, 
by the plaintiff, call it a complaint if you're in the federal system, but Texas procedures say, no, 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 plaintiff doesn't file something called a complaint in the Texas system, we call it a petition. And the term petition also makes sense because it's saying that the plaintiff is petitioning or requesting, making a petition. We've all seen petitions for various things, you know, uh, maybe when you were um, in high school, you might have petitioned um, your, your principal to allow you to have a pep rally or something like that. Um, well, that was a request. And so what is the plaintiff doing but requesting that the court make the defendant do something. So it's getting at the same concept because the plaintiff wants the defendant to do something and the plaintiff knows that he can't make the defendant do it on his own. So he's going to the court in the hopes that the court can persuade or make the defendant do a particular action. Okay, so we have the concept of plaintiff. We know the name of the document he or she is going to file. Then, of course, if we have a plaintiff, we've got to have a defendant, right? And this is the party who's being sued. This is the party that the plaintiff is mad at. And this is the party who's going to respond to the complaint or possibly the petition if we're in a Texas state court. Okay, so when we um, look at a decision, we, we're interested in knowing who the parties are, but we also need to know what is the court that we're looking at. And we're, we're really gonna be looking at two separate issues here. One issue is, are we at the trial court level or are we at an appellate court level? You may recall earlier I talked about that we had three levels in the Texas system. We have the trial court, which is where you go first, Then we have the appellate court, which is this middle level. And we have the Supreme Court. In some sense, the Supreme Court is sometimes lumped in with the appellate court. Ignore this, I did not mean to put it there. Um, and so it's considered an appellate court. Some, and for some purposes, we separate this and treat it as if um, these are separate entities. So, uh, but when we use the term appellate in this context, we're including this and this in the same category. So are we at the trial court level? In other words, is this the first place the plaintiff has gone? Is this where the plaintiff's going to get, a, say, a jury trial? Or is this uh, one party is either won or, or lost at the trial court level, and now we're in the appeal process somewhere in the appeal process? The other issue, are we in the state system or the federal system? And of course, we know state system, we're going to use petition. Federal system, we're going to use complaint. So I pulled up a case just so you can have a, a little bit of an exposure here to what these terms mean. And this is that Dunnings versus Castro case. So looking at this case, we can see that... Um, we have here the parties. So party one is Mr. Dunnings. Party two is Ms. Castro. We can see that we are in, a, in an appellate court. So we've answered that question. And we can see it's a court of appeals of Texas, which means it's a Texas state system. So we can, just by this looking at this little bit here, we can answer these questions with respect to that lawsuit. We know that our Actually, let's go back and see who the plaintiff is. Okay, as, if, as we're reading through, we can see Dunnings, here we have the information, Dunnings sued Castro. So Dunnings is our plaintiff and Castro is our defendant. So going back to here, so we could say, So our plaintiff is Dunnings. And the defendant is Castro. And we know it's an appellate court and we know it's a state appellate court. So by looking at that decision, kind of cutting it into pieces, we can get all this information. Let's go to the next slide. So now we've gotten some background information. Now we're going to look at the parts of the actual decision. 
Um, these parts, these, these last two parts, we're actually not going to look at because we would actually need to have a report. By the way, this is what reporters look like right here. Um, uh, the, the information reporters, the case summary and case head notes are proprietary with West. And so uh, we can't just pull that off of the internet um, without violating uh, uh, their copyright. So we won't actually be able to see these, but let's just talk about what these are so that you will be exposed to the terms. A case summary is at the section at the beginning of a case. So let me just go back to the, here we go. So it would be appearing actually right, um, right here, so where I'm pointing, this is where the, um, the head notes and the case summary would be underneath this particular date, so under 1984, 1994. And, the, and, the, and these two sections here, case summary and head notes, sometimes they just be a possibly even just a page, possibly even less than that, or these could go on for several pages depending upon the complexity of the case. So what do we have here with case summary? It's at the beginning of a case that summarizes general information about the case. It's usually prepared by the publisher of the case. So this would be like say West, uh, the Republic, publisher of Southwestern Reporter. And it is oftentimes called a syllabus. Um, more commonly that term is used when you're talking about the US Supreme Court decision, but sometimes used for other cases. Obviously this has a different meaning syllabus than what we think of in a college environment, the term syllabus. But in a way it's similar. I mean a syllabus is after all a summary of what we're going to be covering in a K in a particular semester. So it's kind of analogous, a uh, summary syllabus type idea. Another thing that we see in um, right before a case under the case summary are the head notes. And again, these are a short summary at the beginning of a case that identifies a point of law within a case. It is prepared by the publisher. I'm sorry, that's a typo. By the publisher and is not part of the formal opinion. So it's again prepared by West. And so a, a case that covers several different legal concepts might have several different head notes. Sometimes you'll have 30 or 40 head notes, each one about a paragraph long. Uh, some cases might just have one or two. It really depends upon the complexity of the case. Okay. Um, so we've taught so we won't be able to see these, but the, these right here we can see in many cases. Um, most of the published opinion is going to be um, the reasoning. Most of the decision is going to be the court not just saying what the result is, Bob wins or Larry wins, but saying this is why Bob wins. These, this is how I got from, uh, let me, uh, first of all, let me summarize the facts and then let me talk about the law and, let, and then I'm going to explain to you why I got to where I got. And so that reasoning makes up the bulk of the decision. And you may think, well, gosh, if I were a judge, why would I have to explain myself? I mean, I'm, I'm the boss. You know, my boss doesn't explain himself or herself to me. Uh, he doesn't need to or she doesn't need to. Um, but the reason that we have the reasoning of the decision really goes back to the whole idea of stare decisis, mandatory authority. Because it's only when the next judge can understand the thought process of the earlier judge that that next judge can apply that reasoning to the new set of facts. If you just had a decision that says Bob wins, well, why did Bob win? Did Bob win because Larry waited too long to file his lawsuit? Or maybe he won because Larry didn't prove a particular aspect that he needed to. Or maybe he won because uh, Larry wasn't believable. Uh, lots of different things can go wrong in a case. And if we don't have the explanation as to what part of the case uh, was significant, then it's not really possible to have a stare decisis precedent-based common law system. So the reasoning is by far the most important part. Now, sometimes when the court is involved in explaining its reasoning, it uh, uses dicta. Dicta is the plural form of the word dictum, more commonly used, frankly, than dictum, but you can use either term. It's actually short for obit or dictum, but almost nobody says that. Um, and that's just kind of a, an aside, uh, a comment that doesn't necessarily 
um, have a lot of significance. Uh, it's an argue by analogy. Let's imagine that we had a case. Uh, Bob, I was at a red light and Bob rear-ended me at the red light. He was on his phone not paying attention and he you know, just wasn't paying attention to hit my car. And he, him rear-ending me caused the front of my car to enter into traffic and I got sideswiped by traffic and my car was, was pretty badly hurt and maybe I was hurt as well. I'm suing him under these circumstances. And um, Bob's argument was um, he... Uh, it wasn't his fault because after all, most of the damage was, was caused by Larry who was driving a car um, in the cross traffic. Now, of course, Larry had a green light, so Larry was doing what he was supposed to be doing, but Bob's position is Larry is actually the car that caused most of the body damage to my car, so therefore Larry ought to be responsible for it, not, not Bob. And so the judge is considering this argument. And the judge says, well, well let's imagine that the facts were a little bit different. Let's say that um, um, uh, Groover uh, had stopped at the um, uh, red light and um, had, uh, had a, a seizure and her foot had come off of the brake because as a result of the seizure over which she had no control. And so therefore her car uh, rolled forward into the intersection. Uh, would we hold Larry responsible for hitting Groover's car under those circumstances? And so the court might analyze that particular issue and say, well, no, Larry isn't responsible for that because Larry is supposed to be entering the intersection on a green light. Um, and so the court would then say, okay, so we know the answer when, when Groover has the epileptic seizure. Now let's consider the case that's actually before us. In the, in the real case, Groover didn't have an epileptic seizure. The reason why Groover's car entered the intersection uh, was because of Bob's action, not because of any kind of medical issue. Um, and so the dicta is that, uh, that uh, description of the incident that didn't happen. It was offered to help explain how the court resolved the actual facts of this particular case by looking at another how another fact pattern would have been decided. But you can see how that whole example of epilepsy is in some sense irrelevant because that didn't happen. Nobody is saying that Groover had an epileptic seizure. Bob isn't saying it. Larry isn't saying it. Groover's not saying it. In some sense, n none of the three of us care one way or the other how that particular case would have been resolved because it's not what happened. And yet it was an important building step for the court to use to get to how, he, how that court's going to resolve the particular case that actually is in front of the court. So dicta is very common in decisions, but it's not directly related to the reasoning of, of the case, of the case that's actually in front of the court. As a result, dicta has no binding authority. Even if the Texas Supreme Court issues a decision, um, which is obviously uh, binding on courts in our jurisdiction, but if that decision includes dicta, and they commonly do, that dicta, um, would not be a mandatory authority. That particular part of that decision would be a persuasive authority. So let's imagine that this decision gets published and 10 years later, actually what was described in the dicta in, in the decision between Bob and me actually happens. Somebody actually does have an epileptic seizure. His foot comes off of the brake. He enters the intersection. He's hit by a car and he sues maybe the driver of that car. Um, under those circumstances, uh, when both sides are researching the law, they both come across this case where there is this dictum. Well, guess what? It's a persuasive authority. It's not a mandatory authority. Even if the Texas Supreme Court had used that story because that was not actually the story in front of that court, it is not a binding authority. So that's how dicta works. The holding is the application of all this lovely reasoning to the particular facts of that particular case. So let's look at our case 
went back here. We're back to Dunnings versus Castro. And let's just look at some holdings here. we we'll go down to the negligence section. Maybe it's a little bit easier to find it here. Usually when you see words like hold, that's a good indication that we have a holding. We hold in accord with Marshall, the, re the restatement of torts and various other resources, that the owner of a dog may be liable for injuries caused by the dog, even if the dog is not vicious, if the plaintiff can prove that the owner's negligent handling of the animal caused the animal to injure the plaintiff. So we could say that this is the holding of the case. We could also say that this is the holding. We sustain the point of error number two and remand the cause to the trial court. So you could be very specific. Of course, this particular holding, which is oftentimes called the disposition of the case, you know, this doesn't make sense in, in isolation. What? What is error number two? Uh, what's being remanded exactly? What is the trial court supposed to do? That doesn't tell you any of this. The only, this sentence only makes sense once you understand everything that came before it. A lot of times in the first paragraph, you also get a lovely summary. We reverse and remand it very brief in this case. Again, you know who won and who lost. Um, we know that the appellant won, so Dunnings is delighted with this decision. Castro is really bummed about it. And we know that it's going to be returned to the trial court, but we don't know all the ins and outs, why it's being reversed, what part of it's being reversed, what is the trial court supposed to do once it gets back to the trial court. So you really have to read the whole thing to get all of that, those lovely details. But uh, we would be looking in the case for this type of information. And as you're reading cases, we won't be reading a lot of cases in this particular course, but as you're reading cases, it's very common to you know, have different colored highlighters. So you'd have one highlighter, for example, for the reasoning, another highlighter for holding, another color for highlighter for the facts, another color for dicta, all of those lovely categories so that you can keep it straight and distinguish between the various parts. So I'm going to um, end the lecture at this point, and we will have a second lecture covering uh, the remaining parts of Chapter 1. I hope that this information has been useful to you. As always, uh, feel free to I'm sorry, uh, reach out to me if you have questions. Again, especially if this is your first semester in the program. Uh, I know I covered some of these concepts pretty quickly, and so you may need or would like a little bit deeper explanation about some of these. So don't be shy reach out to me, email me, come by my office hours so we can explore these issues in more detail. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you have a great day.